good news this morning is that Steve and the choir and all of us can have Jesus this morning, morning, noon, and night, because the Lord is still risen indeed. Now sometimes the season of Sundays after Easter is called low season because sometimes attendance declines during that period. Well, we have an opportunity to reverse that trend. Because of the blessing of a large sanctuary, last Sunday we safely accommodated more than 100 people and still stayed well within our established guidelines. So if you're watching online, I'd like to challenge you to help make this low season a high season. If you feel comfortable attending in person, when you go to register online, if it lets you register, that means that we can still accommodate you safely here. And I'd like to ask those of you who are here in person today to, to please stand for a moment. And when I give the signal, the choir is going to shout out, the Lord is still risen. And all of you, and that includes the, the tech team in the balcony and those of you taking part um, on, in the service online, all of you can shout, the Lord is still risen indeed. So let's give that a try. The Lord is still risen. The Lord is still risen But now let's turn it around. I'm asking you all to shout out, The Lord is still risen. And then they're going to respond, The Lord is still risen indeed. So here we go. The Lord is still risen. The Lord is still risen indeed. Ah, please be seated. Now the reason for all this shouting is because we celebrate the life and the light and the fellowship that we have in our risen Lord. And we pray together these words from 1 John and from Psalm 133. 
We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life evermore. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world.
Welcome to New Philadelphia Moravian Church on this Sunday, April 11th, second Sunday of April. Um, we begin announcements this morning with some general thank yous for everyone who helped make Easter and Holy Week so special. Um, there were so many of you who were here on Good Friday to help make the God's Acre experience just extraordinary. We thank you. Um, all of the musicians and their contributions, also those who delivered flowers on Easter Sunday, it is always dangerous when you're thanking people to name any individuals um, for fear that you will leave out someone um, who did something over and beyond. But I'm just going to take that chance this morning and make three special um, thank yous. The first to Rick Green, um, who drove the bus and made some women very um, happy. What a gift that was on Good Friday evening. And then two of my coworkers, Zach Wright for corralling and organizing the youth who helped put candles out on Good Friday evening, and also Tim Reynolds, who had the Herculean job of erecting those banners in God's Acre. I am so thoroughly convinced that nobody would have done such a thorough and beautiful job, and it really um, created something that was breathtaking for everyone who was here. So those are my thank yous for Easter, and speaking of yes, yes, Lord, thanks to everybody who said yes and came out and helped make the week so special. Secondly, um, you have heard about Teacher Appreciation Week, which is the first week of May. We've been asked to do something for the teachers on one of those days during the week, and many of you have said you'd like to be part of that. If you would, and I hope you're available on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, let's gather under the pavilion and talk about what we might do. Um, we'll just toss out some ideas and see how we can best show our teachers at South Fork that we really appreciate them. Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock in the pavilion. Before Easter, I mentioned that we were going to do something special this year for the third graders at South Fork. This is our next big South Fork project for students. We're going to send third graders home with books for the summer. And I'm really happy this morning to report that all of those books for 79 students, um, there will be five books per student, they have already been underwritten by ge very generous donors. You know who you are, so we appreciate that. But I will need folks to help wrap the books because we'd like to actually present them as a gift. So you will hear more about that a little later. Um, the rose here on the communion table is in memory of Billy Holton. Um, our sister Billy um, was uh, dis our Billy died this past week, and services will be um, held very soon. And then, lastly, throughout 2021, we're focusing on six stewardship keys. Pastor Gray has already introduced the first key, which is worship. When we offer our gifts to God. We are, they bless others, but we also find that we ourselves are blessed as well. So in our stewardship moment this morning, Jerry Tucker is going to share how he is blessed when he offers his gifts during worship. Good morning. <laughs> Pastor Sam texted me Wednesday and asked if I would say a few words for stewardship. On worship well I thought a little bit and texted him back said I've never done anything like this before I'm not very good at speaking in front of people but I would try it. well then a few little while later he texted me back with a big thumbs up so here goes my few words as some of you know, I have been a member of New Philadelphia for more than 60 plus years. And most of those 60 plus years, I've been either singing in school, special courses, the congregation, and in the choir. And someone, after singing a solo one Sunday, some people came up to me and said, you have a God-given talent. 
So with this talent, a bunch of years ago, this was when I sang this solo, and after this talent, so by using this talent, I feel that it is the best way that I know how to serve my God and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through worship. I thank you from my heart to your heart. Jerry told me that he wasn't sure about speaking in front of people, but I had heard him belt out those bass solos in front of people, and I said, well, just sing what you have to say. But I'm glad that he, I'm glad that he did find the, find the nerve to be able to say it, and we thank you for using your gifts for God's glory. In the gospel reading that we will hear in a few minutes, Jesus appears to his disciples and breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That breath of the Spirit is still in the air that, that we breathe. And it helps us to breathe in the things that God wants to be in us and then breathe out or exhale the things that God's Spirit helps to remove from us. So as we pray today, I invite you in silence to, to breathe in and, and breathe out and let the Spirit work within us as we breathe in those things that God wants to fill us with and breathe out those things that don't give glory to God. So let's pray. Lord God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. We breathe in your love and we release our insecurity. We breathe in your joy and we release our unhappiness. We breathe in your peace and we release our anxiety. We breathe in your patience. And we release our impulsiveness. We breathe in your kindness. And we release our indifference. We breathe in your goodness. And we release our ungodliness. We breathe in your faithfulness and we release our disloyalty. We breathe in your gentleness, and we release our severity. We breathe in your self-control, and we release our self-indulgence. God, we lift up to you today those who need that breath of your spirit in a special way. We left Lift up Jeff Chryson and Marsha Hansley and Roger Jones and the family of Billy Holton and Jeffrey Jones and Brian Huffman and Angie Williams Brown and Beth Bird and her family and Michael Krotz and others in need of your presence in a, in a close and special way today. Breathe on us, breath of God. Amen.
reminder that you can continue to support the many and varied ministries of New Philadelphia Moravian Church with your tithes and offerings. If you are present here, there are offering plates out in the, in the vestibule. If you are watching online, you can mail in your offerings to New Philadelphia at 4440 Country Club Road, 27104. Or you can also visit our website and use one of the secure giving portals there on that website. I share again the prayer in our daily text for today. Where is our treasure, Lord? Help us to offer open and giving hands to you and to your people, destroying barriers of greed that can shield us from you. Use our gifts. Amen. <laughs>
When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and the hands in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood with them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. I hear that scripture that we heard this morning, I've always felt badly for Thomas. He gets a bad rap 
forever after referred to as Doubting Thomas. But if we put ourselves in his place, wouldn't we have been doubtful too? Think about it. The disciples, just days before, had watched as their leader, their teacher, their friend, Jesus, died a really awful death on the cross. I bet they watched from the shadows as he was buried. Their hearts were still heavy. And then someone walks in and says, oh, hey, I just saw Jesus. He's alive and he's walking around and he's talking to people. If we had been there, wouldn't we be doubtful too? No wonder Thomas wanted proof. So Jesus, understanding that his disciples had doubts and fears, showed them his nail-scarred hands, his spear-pierced side. He used his wounds as his ID, his proof. Yes, it really is me. And then they believed. The weight of the world was lifted off their shoulders when they realized he really was who he said he was. And from then on, people recognized the disciples by their actions, by their faith. Their different way of acting, their different way of believing was their ID. So what about us? What's our ID? Do we get a card when we decide to follow Jesus? Do we get an ID when we become a member of a church? like members of a secret club or an elite group or something? I didn't ever get a card like this, did you? So how can we prove that we're followers of Jesus if we don't have an ID? In our liturgy this morning from 1 John, it said, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is in the light. We should live in the light, and if we live in that light, we share fellowship with each other. And when we live in the light, the blood of the death of Jesus, God's son, is making us clean from every sin. Wow. That means we don't need an ID to prove that we're followers of Jesus because we prove that we belong to him by how we treat each other, by how we act together, how we get along with other people. If someone doesn't yet know Jesus and they have questions, they should be able to look at us and see proof in our actions that we're set aside, we're different from others in the world, that we love Jesus. If someone knows that we attend New Philadelphia Moravian Church on a Sunday morning, they should be able to hear in our words and see in our actions all week that we go to church and we love Jesus. We don't need an ID card because our actions are our ID. Now, before we get all carried away, does that mean that after we say we believe in Jesus, that we're sinless and we never mess up? Goodness, no way. If we did have IDs and we got black X's when we messed up, I think mine would be all black. But at least, you know, when, when we, I can't speak for all of you, but knowing that mine would be covered with black, to know that Jesus' sacrifice is still necessary every day of our lives, but in 1 John, he tells us we have an advocate in the Father, with the Father in Jesus. Jesus is our advocate with God. That means Jesus clears all those X's away every time we look. And the really cool thing is, that means God doesn't ever even have to see them. So when he looks at us, he doesn't see our black marks on our ID. He sees Jesus in our place. So because of Jesus' sacrifice, we don't need an ID card. We prove that we belong to God. We show that we love Jesus by choosing every day, minute by minute, to walk in the light, treat other people with kindness, so that our reflection of Jesus is our ID, and our words and our actions 
show that we belong to him. So would you pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, we confess that we can be an awful lot like Thomas. Help us to believe. And then, Lord, help us to help others to believe in you when they see us in action this week. We love you. Amen. It was Easter Sunday evening, not Sunday one week ago, no, Sunday more than 103,000 weeks ago, the first Easter Sunday. The disciples were gathered in that upper room where they had gotten together for the Passover meal on Thursday evening, and I'm sure it brought back some memories of the events of the past three days. Jesus had washed their feet there in that room and and prayed for them. And he had taken the bread that they always ate on Passover. But this time he had said, this is my body that is broken for you. And they may have wondered what that meant, but they were also probably worried that they knew exactly what it meant. And it became clearer when Jesus took the cup the wine that they always shared as part of that meal. But he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant that was shed, that is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And he had told them to always eat this bread and drink this cup in remembrance of him. It all sounded so gloomy, so final, like everything was coming to an end. And it got very real when they found out that one of their own, one who had been with them for three years and who was sitting at the table with them, was going to betray their teacher. He was going to turn him over, sell him out to the authorities so that they could put him on trial and then put him to death. And Friday was was all a blur. There were there were crowds of people, but they weren't shouting Hosanna. No, they were shouting crucify him, and they had nailed him to a wooden cross. They drove nails through his his hands and his feet, and they hung him up to die. And he had said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that kind of forgiveness sounded so divine. But then he said, I'm thirsty, and that sounded so human. And they were almost relieved when Jesus had said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up his spirit. But the soldiers had to get one last blow, and so they took a spear and pierced his side. Saturday had been really tough. The unknown can be exhausting and frightening. And I can imagine that there in that upper room, The disciples were were reliving all of these events in their minds, and they were probably saying things like, what if, and why didn't we, and could we have? It was frustration and, and despair. Yes, Jesus had told them that this was going to happen. He had told them that this would not be the end of the story, but now the reality was sinking in, And they had to wonder, what now? Well, on Sunday morning, Peter and John had had gone to the tomb and they saw strips of linen and cloth, but no body. And, And they thought that was a good sign. John believed that it was. But the women had gotten there first. And Mary Magdalene actually saw Jesus and heard his voice. And she went and told the disciples but they hadn't seen for themselves. So they were back in that upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. They were probably wondering if they would be next. But you know the story. Lo and behold, Jesus showed up. Remember, the doors were locked, but John says simply, Jesus came and stood among them. And they had the doors locked for fear of the Jews, but Jesus greeted them with a Jewish greeting. He said, Shalom, peace be with you. 
So they had his presence and they had his peace, but Jesus knew that they needed proof. So he showed them his hands and his side, his hands with, with the scars from the nails and his side with the wound from the spear. And all the disciples rejoiced when they saw their Lord. Well, all except for Thomas. Somehow, Thomas missed the memo about the Sunday evening meeting in the upper room, and he wasn't there. So later, those disciples who were there and who did see his hands and his side shared the news with Thomas. Hey, you should have been there. It was amazing. He just came right into the room and said, Shalom, just like he used to do. And I like to imagine Thomas interrupting them at this point and asking, so how did you know for sure that it really was Jesus? And how might they have responded? Well, because he showed us the wounds on his hands and, and, and in his side. And Thomas would have said, well, hey, that's great. As soon as I can see what you saw and actually touch it, get my hands on it, then I'll know and I'll believe too. So now fast forward one week to the following Sunday, today. They were all gathered together again, and this time Thomas was there. Jesus shows up again and says the same thing, just like last Sunday. Shalom, peace be with you. And then Jesus showed Thomas the wounds, just as he had done with the other disciples, but then he let Thomas touch them, put his finger in the mark of the nails and in his hand and in his side. And then what did Thomas do? Well, remember, when the other disciples saw and believed, what did they do? It says they rejoiced. Now, I'm not sure how they expressed that joy. Maybe they, they sang a song or, or shouted like we did or, or something. But what did Thomas do when he knew it was the Lord. He responded with a declaration of faith, an amazingly strong declaration of faith. He said, my Lord and my God. Think about what that means. We've looked at that word Lord before. There were lots of lords in those days, people who owned property and even owned people. We don't use the word Lord outside of church very much these days. In church, we use the word in songs and liturgies all the time. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, have mercy upon us. But do we realize what we're saying? When Thomas declared, my Lord, he was basically saying, I'm yours. I belong to you. I'm sold out, all in, 100%. I'm not just joyful and happy and ready to sing some songs. No, I'm ready to let my beliefs change me, ready to let what I believe determine what I do and even who I am. I don't think I'm reading too much into that statement. Tradition tells us that Thomas ended up going to India to tell the folks there about Jesus and help them see and experience what he saw and experienced. He died there in India, and at least some sources say that he was martyred for his faith. And yet, yes, Evie, we still call him Doubting Thomas, even after he believed. Now, that may say something about our human tendency to, to focus on a person's flaws and failures. We learn from the business world that it takes 12 positive experiences to make up for one unresolved negative experience. But Thomas's negative action, if doubt can be called that, was resolved big time, I might add. As far as I can tell, and I'm, 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 I'm certain of this, Thomas is the only person in all of the New Testament who ever refers to Jesus as God. We can thank him for that bit of doctrine that is so important to us. I think the problem is in the way that we interpret Jesus' response to Thomas when he made that declaration of faith. Jesus said, have you believed in me because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Who was he talking about? 
I don't think he was talking about the other disciples. He wasn't comparing Thomas to them and, and lifting them up and, and putting Thomas down. No, remember, they too had seen just like Thomas. The only difference was that Thomas had been more hands-on, up close and personal. But they had all seen. So when Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe... Who is he talking about? I think he's talking about us. Anyone who was not there in that room with them, anyone who didn't see but has come to believe. And I think Jesus is challenging Thomas and all of the disciples to somehow find a way to let others see what they saw after Jesus is gone. Evidently, they all took him seriously because here we are. So when we hear Jesus' statement as a, as a rebuke, scolding Thomas, I think not only do we miss the point, but we sometimes give people the idea that there's no room for doubting or questioning any aspect of our faith. And we also, I think, fool ourselves into thinking that faith is not a hands-on thing, that believing simply means some sort of mental adherence to a creed or code without ever questioning what those statements really mean or how these beliefs should change what we do and even change who we are. Thomas is never called Doubting Thomas in the Bible, but he did have a nickname. His nickname was Didymus which means the twin, not doubting Thomas, no, Thomas the twin. We never find out who his twin brother or twin sister was. They're never mentioned or named. But you know what? I think I may have found Thomas's twin brother or sister. They're all around us. There are a lot of people today, some of them young, but, but not all, who want to experience faith, not just hear about it or talk about it or even sing about it or buy into it because someone else has seen it and tells them they ought to buy into it because it's the right thing to do. No, they want to touch the wounds. They want to put their finger in the mark of the nails and put their hand in his side. And sometimes, I'm afraid, it's as if we, as the church, are saying to them, shame on you for wanting to be that close to Jesus. Hearing about it should be enough. We've seen it, so let us tell you. All you need to do is respond with the lines that are in bold print. And I wonder if you noticed something that I think is really important. Did you notice what it was that proved to Thomas that this really was Jesus? The evidence that Thomas needed in order to be able to proclaim Jesus as Lord and God was not a crown or, or a halo or rays of light streaming down from on high. You know, you might think that that whole walking right through a locked door thing might be pretty convincing, but no. What Thomas needed to see and touch were the wounds, the scars. For Thomas, those wounds were the proof of Jesus' sacrificial love. In our Moravian history, Zinzendorf had special praise for Thomas and even lifted him up in some of his writings as an example for all believers. He even called, Zinzendorf even called Thomas the first theologian because Thomas recognized Jesus' divinity in his wounds. Because you see, Jesus Christ is our lamb who has conquered, but he is also the lamb who was slain. And this story tells us that on that third day when he rose from the grave, when he conquered death, in the midst of victory, in the midst of ongoing peace and, and presence of Christ, the scars are still there. And Jesus tells his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. How has the Father sent him? The Father sent him in all his woundedness and with all of his scars. Because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, scarred for our iniquities. And by his stripes, his wounds, we can be healed. So if he sends us out just as the Father has sent him, I think that means that he sends us out to share the good news, scars and all. 
Scars tell part of the story of who we are, what has mattered to us, what has happened to us, the risks we've taken, the gifts we've given, the work we've done. And sometimes our scars, instead of getting in the way of the message, can actually be part of the proof that others need in order to believe the message when we share with them the forgiveness and healing that we have found in the one who was wounded. Like Zinzendorf and like Thomas, I think sometimes I relate more to the woundedness of Jesus than to the majesty and glory part. I'm not denying or downplaying that glorious aspect of our Savior, but personally, I find a God who suffers, a God who weeps, a God who is thirsty, a God who is despised and rejected. I find that God to be a God who has a profound impact on my heart and on my life, a God I can relate to, a God I want to share with others who might also be suffering or weeping or thirsty or despised and rejected. So when I go out and show people my own woundedness as well as the healing that I have found in a wounded Savior, Sometimes those wounds, ironically, bring healing and peace and comfort. John tells us that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples and lots of other things that are not written down in his book. He chose not to include them. But that these things that are written there are there so that people may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing we might have life in his name. I'm really glad that he included this story, the story of scars and wounds and doubts, because that says to me that this good news is good news for everyone. People with scars, people with baggage, people with questions, people with doubts and fears, people like Thomas and the disciples, People like me, and maybe people like you. Let's pray. God, we thank you that it was for our transgressions that you were wounded. It sounds like fancy language, God, but it means that you suffered for us, that you bore the weight and the penalty of our sins. We thank you that even in your glorious resurrection, those scars and those wounds are still there to remind us of your sacrificial love for us. Help us to find healing and and forgiveness in you, and help us to take the risk of sharing our woundedness with others and share how we have found that healing and that comfort and that peace, and even the answer to some of our questions in you. God, we come before you with our brokenness, our woundedness, and even with our our doubts and fears. But we thank you that you give us your presence and your peace and your promise to be with us always. In Jesus' name, amen.
take just a moment to look around and wave at, at those around you. And as I lift one hand asking God's blessing on us and on those who are watching online, I also lift another hand and I would ask you to do the same, thinking specifically of someone who is wounded, someone who bears scars that can be healed, whatever kind of scars they are, by the woundedness of our Lord and Savior. So we ask God's blessing on us and on them as well. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Spirit and of our risen Lord be with us all. Amen.